definitely appreciate it. God bless you. It's always a privilege to preach in the house of God. Especially on Christmas morning, Sunday. I call it Christmas Sunday. Christmas is going to be later in the week. Would you stand with me for prayer? Let us pray. Father God, we worship you today in our songs and in our actions, in our giving and all that we do. We worship you, the Most High. We praise your holy name for who you are. You are our creator. You are the giver of our life. You're the giver of your only begotten Son to redeem us from sin. And Lord, we confess our sin today and ask for forgiveness. May the blood of the Lamb of God wash us white as snow. Jesus, you are our Savior. Praise your holy name. We know that we are healed by your stripes and we thank you Jesus for we pray for the sick today and the other needs of the church especially these on our prayer list today we pray for Brandon Davenport Bernie and Dreema and, and their family Don's family uh, Mike Adams, Tom Batten Steve Batten and James Batten Kathy Rojas and their Thurgood family and all of our frontline workers need a special touch, a special protection during this time. You are aware of each individual's need, whether it be physical healing, a financial touch, whatever it may be, we pray that you would meet these needs in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for the peace of Israel and that your will would come forth and bless and protect her. Lord, with all the bright lights that mark Christmas time, help us all to remember the true reason for the season. We celebrate the coming Messiah, and he is here with us today as he lives in us, in our spirit. As we give our gifts from you under the evergreen tree, help us remember that our gift to you is our devotion to serve you. May the Holy Spirit cause our hearts to receive the Word of God today in a transforming manner. That our life would be changed from temporal to everlasting. For we pray in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. You may be seated. You may or you may not know Dr. Harold E. Jones. He has uh, gone to glory. He is my, was my father-in-law, a prophetic uh, uh, Pentecostal minister, a pastor of churches uh, in Virginia, uh, the church over on Centerville that he started back in 1964. It's still there today. And it's called uh, the Embassy Church. He's written many books, and I have uh, one of his songs that he wrote. I'm going to read to you because you don't want me to sing it to you. The Day the Christ Was Born. It was a still, hallowed night. The earth seemed so forlorn. A busy world had gone to sleep before the Christ was born. The shepherds on a lonely hill, their robes all frayed and torn. From angels they received the news. Tonight, the Christ is born. The lonely stable was aglow, the building old and worn. In swaddling clothes the baby lay. Rejoice, 
the Christ is born. The wise men gathered from afar, their king with gifts adorned. A star was sent to show the way to where the Christ was born. I'm glad that God so loved the world that he on Christmas morn gave man heaven's greatest gift the day the Christ was born. Fear not, I bring you good tidings of great joy this morning. I'm reading in Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And there suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. You know, the angel tells us today to fear not. Don't be afraid. But it's hard for us, after all, we are just frail humans. God wants us to have courage because he sent his son on Christmas morning. God made the way. His name is Jesus. Yes, we all know to walk with God is a journey of a lifetime. But the first step is when we bow our heart and accept Christ as Savior. The angel says good tidings, but why should we be so upbeat today? If we look at the 6 o'clock news, we see people losing their jobs. We see people, we have a new phrase this year. It's called food insecurity, hunger insecurity. You know, when school was in session, the kids had breakfast and lunch, taking care for them. But now, since school is not in session, the parents have a challenge. And with people being out of work, everything seems to be much more difficult at this time. Even many of our worship leaders are out today because of the epidemic. I met a young lady this past uh, week or so, and I invited her to church today. And I want to welcome Rona with us this, this morning. You wouldn't believe the experience at DMV when you get a young lady like this to help you. It was actually pleasant. And, and we all know the history of DMV's experience. But I like what they're doing now, doing appointments. Life right now is tough, but I got news for you. There's no microwave easy answers. I don't know about you, but I use my microwave every day. Every day. It heats my coffee. It cooks my lunch. It does it all. It just doesn't seem to me. But God reminds us to hold on. Help us on the way. Don't give in to temptation and don't give up on your faith in God. Help is on the way. Now we all know that the news items about the vaccines that are on the way but then it might, may not reach most of us until in the springtime or maybe maybe a little bit later 
But there's some hope out there. And keep your hand in the nail-scarred hand of Jesus. We're all struggling right now. But God gives us seven reasons we should live with courage in our heart. Number one, God gives us blessings in the journey to strengthen our faith. You remember the story in Genesis 26? There had been a drought, and Isaac's men were digging wells, and there was a bit of a problem about that. Let's look a little closer at the situation. Isaac's men were in the desert. They needed water for their sheep and goats. They were getting desperate to get water for their flocks or their sheep and goats would surely die. It was very hot and dry. They thought they would have to dig a well to find water. It's not easy digging a well when you don't have pneumatic tools and power equipment like we have today. They couldn't call down to Home Depot rental center and say, Hey Joe, have you got an auger today? I need to dig a well. No, what did they have? They had rudimentary tools, shovels, picks, and that's about it. This was a very arduous task very difficult thing to do. I could only imagine days upon days the men digging in the heat of the desert. Getting closer to the water that meant life for all. Then here comes the men from Gera. You know the story and what they said. You can't dig here. The water rights belong to us. You can't dig a well here. Isaac's men took the camp and traveled a distance after that. They knew it was far enough. Began digging the second well. But you know, the things became really desperate to get everybody the life-giving water. You could just feel the intensity of the situation. Then what do you think happened? Here comes the men from Gera. You can't dig a well here. We own the water rights here, too. So the men moved on even further. They were very discouraged. You can imagine the chins dragging on the ground. You can just see the desperation in their faces. Some felt hopeless to find water. Very arid, extremely hot. Time was running out for their flocks. And their children, children you could hear, crying for thirst. Everyone needed water. Thirst would not stop. Thirst would not be quenched. Thirst on every hand. Everyone needed water. Now let's read Genesis 26, verse 24. And the Lord appeared unto him, and that is Isaac, the same night, and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, I am with thee, and, ble and will bless you, and multiply your seed for my servant Abraham's sake. Determined to find water, Ab uh, Isaac's men continued on even further than before and went through the same process again. This time the well had the blessing of God on it and it provided a fountain of life. The point here is that for us to remember that while we are going through the trials of life, God is with us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He blesses us with his comfort and his help in the difficulties. At this time of the year, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. He is our Emmanuel, God with us. 
The second reason for us to have courage today is the story of Elijah. Let's visit that in Elijah, 1 Kings 17. Reading in NIV. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I could have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, and bring me a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Do you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him up to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life did return to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. And in case you miss this today, this blessing of supply, when our natural source dries up, God is always there. Faith is tested during the journey. Of course, you remember the meal and the oil? It did not fail until the rain came. 
God's supply is always enough. He is our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. The third reason we need to have courage today is that God protects God's protection in perilous times. In 2 Kings verse uh, in 2 Kings chapter 6, it's Elisha working with a young man who is very afraid. The enemy had surrounded the city and their number was very large. Elisha told his scared servant in verse 16, and he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Elisha prayed and God showed the young man the horses and chariots of fire round and about them. God even blinded the enemy and Elisha led them to Samaria where their sight was restored. They didn't even have to fight the enemy. God handled it. You know, this year of 2020 will be remembered for one thing. And we all know what that is. Dare I say it. Coronavirus. But God is with us. He's never left us, nor has he forsaken us. The fourth reason we need to be full of courage is that God gives us strength in the times of our weakness. Can you say amen? Isaiah 41 verse 10, reading from King James, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, yea I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Courage. I would think that all of us know what courage looks like. Once during my years in Bible college, as I was arriving at my part-time job, I had a frightening experience. After I had parked my car in the rear, I had to walk a path alongside the building about a hundred feet. Normally, two German shepherds had been chained at the next door neighbors, but they had just pulled the stake out of the ground and they were loose. There was no fence, no barrier between me and the rampant dogs. And because the dogs had to fight their way loose, they had gotten very agitated. They were heated, their blood was up, and they were looking for something or someone to vent their frustration out on. And of course, I was on the path. Then the moment came, they turned their heads toward me and charged. I wasn't afraid of dogs. I had been raised with dogs my whole life. But these dogs were filled with rage. They were filled with anger. They had pent up frustration. They were looking to see for someone or something to let it out on. And one of the German shepherds lunged at me with their mouth wide open. And he only snapped at me one time but he ripped my slacks from the thigh to the ankle. But he didn't even break skin. He just ran off after that. God knows when to give us courage, doesn't he? Although the story of the dogs charging me was a dramatic one, that kind of courage isn't something we are demanded of every day, but we do need courage every day to live a Christian life just the same. To live for Jesus Christ is to den deny oneself our desires, to do what we know the Scripture tells us to do. Is that not right? At first it's very hard, very difficult. 
Then as we yield to the Holy Spirit and His leading, it becomes easier. But it takes courage to say, no, I'm not going to the hen party after work today. I'm not going to belittle all the co-workers I don't like at work today to make things up and to falsely assume things about my co-workers. It takes courage not to go with the guys after work like you did before you gave your life to Christ. You have had an experience with God. You have been born again. Your life has taken a new direction. With courage, you do not follow the crowd now. You follow Christ. In my case, I had to say, no, don't run. Stand still. That's what my dad used to tell us when, if we were ever charged by dogs. But in your case, it might be, I don't go there, those places anymore. I don't do those things anymore. I don't say those things anymore. With God's help. I'm going to go feed the spirit man. I'm going to church. I'm not going to forsake the assembling of those that believe in Christ. I'm going to go and be part of the community of faith. I'm going to feed the new me that was born on my knees. You know, there are motives for our courage. And you want to have this kind of courage. But how are we inspired to do the right thing? Well, the answer is easy. And you already know. Feed the new spirit. The word of God. It will show you the way, but you have to receive it for yourself. You have to take in the word of God, the living word, every day and renew and renew and renew every day. Is that not right? Sometimes we have compassion for those that are oppressed, like giving to the Salvation Army red kettle uh, to help the poor. Sometimes we have the awareness that God is with us, and we just want to touch someone for Christ like helping the guy at the corner because he's homeless, right? And there's a realization that the cause is God's. And since we belong to God, we should do our part. Yes, we will have the poor always, as Jesus said. But we are supposed to do our part in our little corner of the world. If you believe that, say amen. I want to read Isaiah 10 again from the NIV this time. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be alarmed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will defend you with my righteousness, with my righteous right hand. In this we see the divine presence in that God is with us. We see the divine helper. He is with us to help us at our weakest moment. And we also see his support in that he is holding up us and confirming us in him. Use of the right hand is very important here because it talks about God's righteousness and how he deals with us. He deals with us in power and might and truth and purity. All the best things are from God. Number five, we are not alone. You could say we have companionship with God. Let's look at Isaiah 43, verse 1 through 3, and we'll look at a verse at a time here. But now says the Lord that created you, O Jacob, and he that formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And although this scripture was directed to the Jews of the day, spiritually as adopted sons and daughters, 
God is talking to us today. We are the redeemed. By the shed blood of the Lamb of God, our sins have been forgiven. And the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to us. We are adopted sons and daughters. We have been... You, do you know that when your children are born to you, you accept them from God? And you're happy about that. But how about the child that is at the orphanage? They have to be chosen. And listen to me today. We have been chosen. We have been grafted into the family of God. Into the Jewish nation, if you will. We are redeemed. And God has called us by our name. Because of his son Jesus shedding his blood. We are not alone. We are not alone. Can you say that with me? We are not alone. Verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Do you know that the waters of affliction during this lifetime will come upon you? Believe me. I know you are aware of this. We all are. But God is with you. John 14, 18 tells us, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. God is unchanging. Sometimes we need to be reminded of the fact that God is unchanging. He is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. God is always present. As a believer, God is with us always. Verse 3. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Salvation is of God. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my day. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 37, 39. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Isaiah 12 and verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. We are not alone. We are not alone. God is with us. Number six. Jesus is speaking to us today in Matthew 10, starting with verse 26, about his overshadowing care. I'm reading in the NIV today. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the rooftop. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Hades. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Each one of us have heard this many, many, many times. But it bears repeating because we forget sometimes that God knows more about us than we know about ourselves. He knows what you like. He knows what you dislike. God knows what you enjoy. He knows what you just tolerate to avoid confrontation. 
God knows what motivates you to visit someone in need. Whether it's what God wants you to do, or just what someone in the church expects from you. You know, the first is worship to God. The second is an act of duty. And it is our heart attitude that is for us to examine. God wants us to do the right thing for the right reason. Because He cares so much for us, and He knows everything we care about. Look what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. God loves you, and He wants to have an intimate relationship with you. Here it is. You've been waiting for it. Number seven. There is life beyond the grave. John wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Revelation chapter 1, 17 and 18, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look. I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Christ destroys the believer's fear. Who gives us the remedy for our fears? It is Jesus. Jesus lays his right hand on you. And says to us, fear not. It is not by words of men that we are called to look up in hope and confidence. I mean, we're shaking in our boots. But it is He, it's the Lord, our Savior, saying, don't be scared. This should give us great courage right here. You may surely and safely lay aside your fears today. After all, it is King Jesus that has provided the whole armor of God for us to use during this life's journey. The Lord has done battle for us already. So be full of courage. He loves you. Christ not only tells His people not to fear, but He gives us reasons not to fear. One of these is that I am the first and the last. I am He that lives. Or it might be interpreted, I am the living one. And you know, several ideas are contained within this. Christ existing from everlasting to everlasting. Christ, the author and finisher of our, of, of our faith, of all things. Christ, the sum and substance of everything. The words that are expressive of his Godhead. The other traits in Scripture have respect to His humanity. How beautifully they all come together to cause our fears to vanish. Some of these fears are chased away by His Godhead, some by His humanity. To trace away all, Christ speaks to us both as God and as man. I was dead. Yes, the old law had to have a perfect lamb slain for our sins and Jesus was that lamb. This is designed to give us great comfort today. If Christ was dead, why should we fear the approach to the throne of grace where he now sits? But again, if Christ was dead, why should we fear the punishment of our sins? That punishment is past already. If Christ was dead, why should you be afraid to die? Maybe it's because you haven't accepted Christ as your personal Savior. Then you must hear it from me as well. Christ died for the punishment of your sins. To deliver you from this fear to give you everlasting life. And all you have to do is accept Christ as your Savior and repent. 
Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Jesus is alive. He was, he has resurrected. And as we accept Christ, we too look forward to our immortal resurrection one day. I have the keys of Hades and of death. At death there is a separation now, not only from our friends and the world, but even from our very self. Christ has the keys of all these doors. He has the key of the door that separates the body and the soul of his people. You cannot die until Christ with his own hand opens the door. Our last breath in, is the turning of the lock. What serenity, what peace this should give around the deathbed of the believer. And how strong consolation it should give to those who are left behind. Because Adam fell in the garden and brought sin into humanity, a second Adam needed to be born so he could die for our sin. We celebrate his coming on Christmas morning. Second chapter of Luke. Let's hear it again. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone upon around them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Would you stand? Let us pray. Holy Father, we glorify your name. We worship you today. We praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord, that we're here in this congregation today. We praise you for your protection in perilous times. We praise you for the fact that you have never left us nor forsaken us. We magnify your name because you're here in the midst. We pray for those needs of the church today, knowing you're always able and willing to meet those needs. Bless your holy name. Lord, we thank you for the courage that you instill in us to live a Christian life. We are devoted to you and we praise your holy name that you are with us and that with you and us, we can overcome and be victorious in you. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.